We have quite a run on monastic saints this week. Yesterday was the feast day of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who was born into a wealthy and, and high-status high family in France in the 12th century, uh, who could easily have had a career in, in the military or in government or something else, but who chose as a young man to enter a new and very austere branch of the Benedictine movement called the Cistercians. Uh, in contrast to other religious orders around that time, they were very careful to have no servants. They did all their own work. They did all their own manual work. They, they lived by what they were able to produce themselves. And Bernard, who was also quite austere apparently in his own life, rose in the order and was sent off to found, found a new branch of this order in a, a nearby place and in, in the end had several satellite monasteries that were uh, founded as a result of his efforts. He became quite famous. He was known for preaching uh, a sermon that led to the Second Crusade. Uh, but he also had a, a very sort of softer spirituality of his own where he, he really tried to preach to people that they should have a personal and very unmediated relationship with Jesus. So, I mean, it sounds very modern to us now. So, Bernard was yesterday. Today is Abraham of Smolensk, uh, a very, again, a very austere figure. He was uh, a, a Russian monastic who lived in a very poor and, and low-status monastery, but who attracted a large number of people who came to him for advice and in the process of doing that, attracted the jealousy, apparently, of other clergy who brought charges against him, and so he was ordered to not preach and to retire from the world, but later was vindicated and was made the, the abbot of another monastery where he lived the rest of his life. He was apparently very concerned with the second coming of Christ and the last judgment. He lived his life very much in view of how he would be judged at some point in the future, and preach to others they should be thinking the same thing. How would they be perceived if Christ were to return? So a, a very sort of hard-edged spirituality that um, nonetheless apparently won him many followers because apparently he was very gentle and very kind when people came to him in distress and were seeking advice about how to live their lives. Then tomorrow is the feast of St. Rose of Lima. She was a daughter of a family, again, an aristocratic family from Spain that emigrated to, to uh, Peru. And so she was born in, in Lima and grew up there, but from a very early age, had a very deep and personal spirituality. She received the Eucharist every day, which was considered unusual at the time. She practiced penance. Eventually, uh, she decided that she wanted to remain a virgin forever, very much against the wishes of her family, uh, and she continued to live this uh, visibly spiritual life in her parents' house until, in desperation, they gave her her own room on the edge of the house so she could go off and do what she was going to do there. And she began to bring in the sick and the injured to her room to take care of them. She built a little tiny hermitage in the backyard so she could go and do penance and pray there by herself. Eventually, she also began to acquire followers and there are two or three convents around Lima now that are still ones that she founded. And there, there are two or three other saints who, with her, were prominent in what they did in bringing care and, and social concern to a community that was just growing and growing and growing. You can imagine what a colonial city like Lima would have been like for the poor and for those who were on the margins. She was the first uh, person from the Western Hemisphere to be made a saint. And so she's remembered fondly around, around the world to this day. There's a, a shrine of St. Rose of Lima in Philadelphia, so not that far from us. Her spirituality, again, was very much focused on her own unworthiness, but also on what she ought to be doing for others. And so this person who could easily have retired from the world and spent her entire life being penitent and praying saw that as none, uh, rather as a way of encouraging her to get out into the world, to take care of people, and so to, to, to have concern for the poor and for those who were not, were neglected by everyone else. So three very different people with very different 
views of what their spirituality meant, but who looked at their spirituality and took it out into the world in some way, who saw what the world needed, what they understood to be their role in it, and connected that somehow with their, their own relationship with God. Two men and a woman, some who were well-born, some who were quite poor and lowly, and yet somehow they all managed to say, here I am, here is what my faith tells me about myself, here's what my faith tells me about the world, now what am I going to do with it? That, I think, connects each of these people with us. We who are not living a monastic life, who are not living retired from the world, but who go out into the world every day. What better message than to say, well, whatever our faith is, it ought to be informing what we do each day as we go through the places we go, the people we meet, the encounters we have, the experiences and the choices that we make. So, three saints, three examples. Let us perhaps take some small bit of that away and live our lives accordingly. Amen.